called me this morning. I, I just got up the phone just a couple minutes ago. And he told and I oh God. He told me to call the police that I shouldn't go over there. I did not remotely believe that he could harm himself or anybody around him. And when something like this happens, um, it's a shock. It's disappointing. It's pretty heartbreaking, pretty sad, or pretty, uh, you think things like that would happen in your little neighborhood. Something must have been off, how he was treated at home, or you know, he was getting bullied in school. There's something had to be off to get his life to this spot, and then to take down all these other lives as well. And it's a really horrible, heartbreaking thing. Stephen Walter Platel was born in Levittown, New York, on April 6, 1975. Plato lived with his mother, Grace, who provided a caring and loving environment for him as much as she could. As a boy, he was often quiet and withdrawn from the people around him. This made Plato a constant target for bullies who saw his quiet nature as a weakness. He didn't have a lot of friends when he was growing up, and his former classmates remember him as the guy who wore the same San Jose Sharks hockey jersey every day. He wouldn't even change for gym class. This resulted in bullying on an almost daily basis was the kind of trauma that would vastly affect Plato in his adult years. One particular former classmate who wanted to be anonymous went so far as to say that something definitely felt off about the San Jose Sharks fan. He was super quiet and came across as one of the school outcasts. Something must have been off, how he was treated at home or you know, he was getting bullied in school. There's something had to be off to get his life to this spot and then to take down all these other lives as well. And it's a really horrible, heartbreaking thing. Aside from his love of hockey jerseys, Plato had other interests, but the most concerning one was his passion for guns. Even before he could own one, his love for it continued until he had a few collections. By 1995, Plato's withdrawn nature had him preferring to meet people on the internet, and that's how he met Alyssa Garcia. She was born in 1980 and was living in San Antonio, Texas with her parents. Plato felt an instant connection with her, and they spoke often. Alyssa wasn't used to this kind of attention, so she didn't notice that the man from New York was actively grooming her and had successfully built an emotional connection with her. It was enough to make her trust him and let his manipulation go unchallenged. Eventually, however, Plato wasn't satisfied with their long-distance relationship anymore. He decided to drive across the country from New York all the way to San Antonio because he couldn't wait to meet her in person. And just like that, the two strangers who had met online crossed the threshold and turned their relationship into a physical one. Understandably, Alyssa's parents were against their relationship from the start, they knew that she was making a grave mistake, but they felt powerless to intervene since their headstrong daughter had made up her mind. Plato was the one for her, and Alyssa would fight for their relationship, even if it meant turning her back on her family. For a moment, Alyssa's family breathed a sigh of relief when Plato returned to New York, and their daughter was left in Texas under their care. What they didn't know at the time was that the strange man from the internet planned to lure Alyssa away from them. During one of their chats online, he asked the woman to run away from home to be with him, and Alyssa agreed. By the time Alyssa celebrated her birthday the following year, she was living with Stephen Plato in New York and was pregnant with their first child. However, the smokescreen of their honeymoon phase ended, and she soon saw the darker side of the man she had fallen in love with. He was verbally, emotionally, and mentally abusive throughout our 20 years together. He did do many violent things. It was a harrowing time for Alyssa. She felt isolated and alone with a man who often harmed and threatened her. Plato's threats were not something she took for granted. She knew just how violent the man could get, and all she could do was feel sorry for the pets that had taken the brunt of his urge to harm others. The isolated Alyssa couldn't stop him. She had to protect her unborn child first, so she was just thankful that the punches didn't stray toward her. In January 1998, Alyssa gave birth to their healthy daughter, and they named her Denise Plato. Alyssa lovingly doted on her daughter, but the volatile man treated Denise with the same affection he showed their two cats. Plato rarely picked up his daughter and wouldn't even bother to feed or change her diapers. But the most alarming was the man's uncontrollable fits of rage triggered by Denise's crying. Unfortunately, Plato would take his rage out on his daughter. She would cry and it would just instantly trigger him. He would curse, he would tell me to shut her the hell up. Alyssa couldn't do anything but lock herself with her daughter inside the bedroom and rock her gently as tears flowed down her face. She then whispered how sorry she was for the life she was having. Despite the idea breaking her heart, Elisa ultimately decided to place her daughter up for adoption, and unsurprisingly, there were no protests from the reckless father. Soon, the baby was taken in by a loving couple, Anthony and Kelly Fusco. They changed her name to Katie Rose Fusco, 
and gave her a new chance to live outside the dark shadow of her father's turbulent behavior. Anthony was a State Department of Corrections officer, and Kelly was a secretary. The Fuscos lived a normal and stable life in a trailer in a small town north of New York called Dover. They raised Katie in a warm and loving environment alongside their biological daughter. Under their roof, Katie grew up with a love for the arts. At Dover High School, Katie was regarded as a gifted student who excelled in creating comic strips. She planned to attend college and work primarily on digital advertising after graduation. She was happy and content with a bright future ahead of her. In contrast, her birth mother suffered a deep feeling of grief and regret, as if her daughter had died. She ended up being dependent on Platel, which the man used to his advantage. Despite Alyssa's trauma from Platel's violence, she agreed to marry him in 2006. Perhaps it was her inexperience that made Alyssa believe that she could somehow change her husband for the better. She was gravely mistaken. Alyssa's married life steadily declined as the years passed. They lived poorly and were practically surviving day by day. Plato went for long periods when he wouldn't talk to his family and would divert his attention to his gun collection. The worst part was that Plato couldn't keep a job, and this greatly strained Alyssa. As if their situation wasn't dire enough, they welcomed another baby girl nine years after Katie's adoption. Five years later, they had another daughter. Fortunately for Alyssa, her husband became better at caring for their two younger daughters, though he maintained his erratic behavior. For a time, Alyssa thought that she was changing her husband for the better, especially when they moved to Henrico, Virginia. There were good moments, but they were soon darkened by outbursts of violence and the fact that he couldn't keep a job. This forced Alyssa to work multiple jobs so her children could eat. With most of her time working as a supervisor for T-Mobile, Alyssa could not completely protect her daughters from Plato's punishments and his attempt to discipline them. At some point, she threatened to leave him, but the volatile man would explode and tell her that he'd end his own life if she dared. With her husband's threat hanging over her head, she had no choice but to stay with him. Meanwhile, Katie was living the best years of her life. She had a deep love for animals and chose to become a vegetarian. She cared for stray cats, and her college plans were pretty much solidified. Her artistic soul was thriving, and she even wrote about how much she cherished the arts in a blog. Katie's life would have been a fast track to success and happiness, but she had one problem lingering over her for years. She felt like there was a gaping hole inside of her, aware that she had a biological family out there that she didn't know. She wanted to reach out and connect with her roots. And so, Katie searched for them on social media and was amazed at what she discovered. Her biological parents were still together, and she had two sisters with them. That would have been enough for some people. But Katie took the first move and sent them a message introducing herself in August 2015. She was met with enthusiasm and excitement, which spurred her to visit them in person by June 2016. It was a happy and emotional reunion. For Alyssa, she felt unbridled joy at finally seeing her long-lost daughter, who astonishingly had a lot of similarities to her. She spent the past 18 years waiting for news about her, and was rewarded with more than she had hoped for. For Katie, it had finally felt like the emptiness inside of her had filled to the brim. Unfortunately, Plato harbored a different emotion that day for his daughter, and they were of an improper nature. After Katie had returned to Dover, her communication with the Pladeals continued. She could have had it all two families who love her, a bright future, and an education. Unfortunately, the aspiring artist took one step toward a dark path. Instead of going to college, she decided to move to Enrico and live with her biological family. Anthony and Kelly Fusco were powerless to stop her, since they believed she was ready to live her own life. At first, Elisa was thrilled to have her daughter back with her, but soon she noticed her beautiful daughter was spending too much time with her jobless husband, who was also presenting subtle changes. He started paying too much attention to his appearance. He bought new clothes, shaved his beard, and let his hair grow out to match the style that the youth of the time sported. Making matters worse, he started sleeping on the floor of Katie's bedroom. Alyssa questioned him about this, but the man angrily told her to mind her business. For years, the volatile man threatened Alyssa that he'd end his life if she left him. Suddenly, he became enthusiastic about their separation, which led to their divorce in March 2017. Thinking that she's finally free, Elisa left Plato with her two daughters in tow. However, she was shocked when Katie chose to stay with her father. The concerned mother took her daughter aside and told her everything about Plato's violent tendencies and the harm that he inflicted on Katie before they put her up for adoption. Still, Katie dismissed it all. As strange as it all was, things became clear with what Elisa discovered in May 2017. In one of her daughter's journals, she read that Katie had started a relationship with Plato and that she was pregnant. 
The new couple even insisted that Katie be called the stepmother to her sisters. Appalled, Alyssa called her ex-husband to confirm these allegations, and he merely defended that he and Katie were in love. Given this and her younger daughter's journal entry about being afraid of her father, the concerned mother immediately sought legal protection from Playdell to protect her family. This prompted an investigation into the man and his new partner. Despite this, on July 20th, 2017, amidst the investigation into the illegal entanglement of Playdell and Katie, they decided to take things even further. They were illegally married by the lake in Parkton, Maryland, with Playdell having lied in their marriage application. Making things worse was the fact that Grace Pladel, Anthony, and Kelly Fusco were all in attendance and seemed to support the unholy union. By September 2017, Stephen Pladel and Katie Rose Pladel welcomed their son into the world and named him Bennett Kieran Pladel. They lived openly as a married couple in Nightdale, North Carolina, where most people were unaware of their true relationship. For a while, Katie believed that things were going well and that she was getting the perfect ending she'd wanted with Pladel. Unfortunately, Katie didn't know just how deep into danger she was. The investigation into their relationship had collected enough evidence against them, so in January 2018, they were arrested and deported to Enrico County to face charges. Stephen Pladel was released on a $28,000 bond a month later and was barred from ever seeing Katie. The aspiring artist was also bailed out and ordered to move back with her adoptive parents in Dover. Both of their cases were scheduled for a hearing sometime in April 2018. Meanwhile, Bennett was placed in the custody of Pladel's mother, Grace, but there was no ruling against any of the parents from seeing their son. You may recall that those individuals were the subject of an arrest here in Nightdale back in January 2018. I really hope that she realized how truly young she still is and that she has the chance to start over, and I hope she can. Alyssa prayed that her eldest daughter would come to her senses and free herself of Pladel's manipulation. Thankfully, this seemed to come true for a time. While keeping her distance from her father and her son, Katie was able to think things through without Plato's intervention. Weeks passed, and on April 11, 2018, Katie was on the phone with her father. With much difficulty and emotion, she finally got the courage to tell him it was over between them. Katie hoped they could end things in a civilized manner and still raise Bennett in a healthy and loving environment. Unfortunately, the man who had charmed her was replaced by a ball of rage. No matter how Plato tried to fix things between them, Katie wouldn't budge, so the volatile man plotted an alternative to a life without her. On the evening of April 11, 2018, Pladel picked up his son from his mother's house, claiming that he'd allow Katie to video call him so she could see Bennett. His mother believed him despite the fact that contacting Katie would have been in violation of the terms of his bond. Then, at midnight, the man called Grace to tell her he would take his son to New York instead. The next day, Thursday, April 12, 2018, Pladel made his last call to his mother, and this conversation prompted a hysterical Grace Pladel to call the authorities, asking for help. 391, added to the emergency. Uh, my son just called me, and uh, he told me he, oh my God, in North Carolina, uh, he killed his, his and he's in the house. Meanwhile, Anthony Fusco and his adopted daughter left their Dover residence in a black pickup truck. They were heading to Waterbury, where Katie had a job cleaning her grandmother's house. What they didn't notice was that a man inside the Honda minivan was watching them. When the pickup truck pulled out of the driveway, the minivan followed. Then, a few minutes later, Anthony and Katie stopped at an intersection. It was a particularly good day, and Katie felt like a weight had been lifted off her chest with the end of her ill relationship. Unfortunately, Plato had other plans. The minivan pulled up beside the pickup truck, and Pladel ended the lives of Katie and Anthony with his firearm. Witnesses around the area scrambled to call the police and get help for the victims. Somebody shot this guy in the truck. There was definitely an out-of-state police heading to the Melford. I think it was North Carolina. He killed his wife, he killed her father, and he, I can't even believe this is happening. Okay. Days before the preliminary hearing of her case, Katie's hopes, dreams, and life ended in a matter of seconds. Anthony Fusco was a casualty of her dark romantic story. Her only consolation was that she died without knowing the heartbreaking fate of her son, who was later found in their previous home in Nightdale. Katie and her adoptive father were still strapped in with their seatbelts when the police came. And just when the police were about to start their search for Stephen Pladel and his minivan, they spotted his vehicle just over the state border. When they approached it, the assailant was already lifeless in the driver's seat. 
Stephen Platel had ended his own life. He called me this morning. I, I just got up the phone just a couple minutes ago. And he, to, and I, oh God, he told me to call the police that I shouldn't go over there. I did not remotely believe that he could harm himself or anybody around him. And when something like this happens, uh, it's a shock. It's disappointing. Katie, Bennett, and Anthony Fusco were all laid to rest on April 21st, 2018 at St. Charles Borromeo Church in Dover, New York. Alyssa chose not to attend the funeral and avoid the media frenzy. She said her goodbyes privately while mourning for what felt like the second time she lost her daughter. But when it came to Stephen Platel, she felt relief that she and her daughters could finally live peacefully. To be quite frank, it's been a difficult roller coaster of emotions because I am so devastated by the loss of Katie and her adoptive dad and baby but it is such a relief to know that I don't have to look over my shoulder anymore to see if Steve is there. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.